is at play in what Alfred Cannon describes as his strategic midterm change. But with other backbenchers asking constituents about whether a change in leadership is needed, questions are arising about whether he himself should go. I've always spoken with honesty, transparency, and I have stuck by the Chief Minister. Can I continue to do that going forward? Probably not. The Isle of Man Chamber of Commerce is Benny. warning the government Benny. is in denial about challenges just, facing businesses, employees and the economy. The group says the budget is yet another missed opportunity to address many long-running issues, as Simon Richardson reports. According to the Chamber, the budget won't drive economic growth or address the many challenges businesses face in many sectors, such as rising costs, labour and skill shortages. They also claim the island is facing a demographic time bomb that could explode in the next decade. The budget, says Chamber, increases the tax burden for many workers at the same time as increasing the budgets for all government departments, exposing a failure to focus on their efficiency and value for money. Positives identified included help for workers needing childcare and a review of procurement regulations to maximise benefit to the local economy. Farmers on the Isle of Man are being encouraged to ask for help with loneliness and mental health issues. A study by the Farm Safety Foundation revealed that 95% of farmers under 40 believe mental health is the biggest hidden problem facing farmers today. Plans to build 133 new homes in Douglas are being recommended for approval. The Manx Development Corporation hopes its Westmoreland Village proposal will allow shops and businesses to thrive. And two pupils from Bunskol Gelga are heading to Scotland for the Film G Alba Short Film Awards in Glasgow. Cara Rolls and fellow filmmaker Olivia Savage, along with their other classmates, helped write, shoot, perform, edit and play the music for their film The Dam. In international news, Shemima Begum's lost her challenge over the removal of her British citizenship. A former UK Home Secretary took it off her in 2019 and now appeal judges say that was a lawful decision. She was 15 when she left East London and ended up joining Islamic State. Single-use vapes could be banned in Scotland by April next year. Draft legislation has been published to get reaction to it over the next two weeks before it will be taken forward. And bosses at the firm, which has become the first private one to build and touch down on a lunar lander, admit it was a nail-biting day. The, the moon's south pole is thought to contain ice, which could be a valuable resource for future human exploration. And a quick look at the weather, mostly dry and bright today with sunny intervals and only isolated showers, maximum temperature of 7 degrees Celsius. Manx Radio News at 3 minutes past 12, the next at 1 o'clock. In the meantime, keep up to date by following Manx Radio on social media or by going to manxradio.com. There are loads of savers at ShopRite. Don't okay, fear the punami or the price. Seconds. We've got two jumbo packs of Pampers Baby Dry Nappy Pans for just £19. ShopRite savers in store now. At the first store, the bowls were too small. No good for my porridge, Goldilocks thought. At the second store, the chairs were too hard and uncomfortable. Thank but you. at the third store, the beds were so comfy. That's because she was in Millie Chaps of Ramsey, where everything is just perfect. Right now, find bargains across every department at the Millie Chaps Winter Sale, including carpets, flooring, sofas and dining, plus amazing stressless bedroom furniture and accessories. Don't miss the Millie Chaps Winter Sale. Good choice, Goldilocks. Simply income protection from Kestrel Insurance, a choice of benefits. Simple underwriting and peace of mind with a regular income for up to two years if you're unable to work due to illness or injury. Kestrel Insurance is registered with the Isle of Man Financial Services Authority. Manx Mobility in Onken have it all. Daily living in wide-fitting shoes, rice recliners, beds and scooters, including lightweight and airline-approved models. Call in and see how our expert team can make your life easier. Manx Mobility at the top of Summer Hill. Carpetland, the carpet specialist with the island's best value carpet in stock. Often fitted within a week. Furniture Land, for three-piece suites, dining and living room furniture. And a selection of amazing beds. Carpetland and Furniture Land, West Street, Ramsey. The exclusive Karcher store is open with thousands of products, accessories and parts in stock. For Karcher sales and service, Hersham Electrical, Shipyard Industrial Estate, Ramsey. Manx Radio's budget coverage. 
brought to you by Crow Isle of Man. Well, Fast Mai, good afternoon and welcome to this special Budget 2024 programme. Over the next couple of hours, we're going to be diving deep into the numbers, dissecting the financial roadmap for the year ahead here on the Isle of Man. We have an invited audience and an expert panel to help us navigate through those details that really are going to shape our future with the budget this year given the slogan for our financially sustainable future. Well, as ever on Manx Radio, we do welcome your comments, thoughts and questions. You can text 166 or email us studio at manxradio.com. And this programme is also being filmed for your viewing pleasure. You can watch it live at manxradio.com and on Manx Radio's YouTube channel as well. Uh, joining me today is Phil Gorn, armed with a roving mic. Uh, Phil, you've been following the budget and the, the fallout from it over the past couple of days. What do you make it, Phil? Well... The, it, the, there's talk of it being a socialist, certainly a left-wing budget, uh, and yet uh, a lot of the people who are paying the extra tax that's been announced uh, are people who are barely above uh, the minimum wage in terms of their level of earnings. So an interesting budget, certainly a departure from uh, previous governments uh, where they have been much tighter in terms of uh, public spending. Would it have been a budget you could have voted for as a Timwood member? Well, that would be a, a leading question I couldn't possibly answer. Yeah, start as we mean to go on, eh? <laughs> uh, let's meet our panel now then. Firstly, Treasury Minister Dr Alex Allenson. Um, Dr Allenson, you told us it was going to be a difficult budget. You were expecting it to be tricky for some members to accept. Ultimately, six members voted against. That's the highest number of people voting against a budget since the 1990s. What does that tell you? Well, first of all, if I can challenge Phil in terms of a socialist budget, I'm not putting a colour or a badge on this. This is a budget for the Isle of Man and the Isle of Man people. And it's the, my, my second budget. It also feeds in quite clearly to some of the long-term strategies, such as the island plan, such as the economic strategy. So we need to see this rather than just a single headline of 2% increase in the upper rate of income tax. What I'm hoping we can do in this programme is delve under the details of this. Now, we had a lively debate about this quite rightly in Timwald. You're quite right, six people voted against the budget as a whole, but actually all of them voted for the components of the budget, including the tax increase. So, you know, I've tried to talk to some of those members about their motivations for voting against the budget as a whole. Actually, when you take this budget as a whole, the 2% tax increase to fund significant investment into public services that will really help the people of this, this island, I think is key to our long-term prosperity. But it's also part of a wider way that we can change our taxation strategy to leverage that investment by depending less on individual taxation and more on, on alternative forms of revenue coming into government. Is it not time then for the budget to be voted on in parts, as was suggested in Timwood this week? Well, there were lots of suggestions in terms of budget reform. What I think this government is absolutely committed to do is deliver um, for the Isle of Man people. The budget actually funds that. Now, what we've done is try to expand the budget process so that members get get the details of the budget a lot earlier. They're allowed to, you know, ask to come to Treasury, discuss the various par parts of it. They do get a chance to vote on it separately, and there were several votes in terms of the changes to taxation, the changes to national insurance, the changes to benefits, going right the way through the sitting we had on Tuesday. And it, almost everyone voted for all of those component parts of the budget. You talk a lot about things that might need to be changed, you know, looking at thresholds for benefits, etc. You talk a lot about the, the tax strategy, which will come to Timbald next month. It's a really very much in that, would you say? Yes. The, I mean, the, the tax strategy is in really important, both for this administration and administrations coming forward, both for us to look at it, and what we're doing there is looking at individual taxation, also international taxation measures, and our reputation in the international community, which are all incredibly important for people who do business here. But also it's an outward looking document in terms of the United Kingdom, Europe, the rest of the world, to show that we are a financially responsive country which will respond to the three years of challenges we've had in a responsible and long-term way, rather than make very short-term changes that will damage the long-term prosperity and future of the people of this island. I'm sure we'll come back to much more a little bit later, but we're also joined on the panel by Chief Minister Alfred Cannon. Chief Minister, I think it's fair to say it's been 
a turbulent week for your government, the sudden replacement of your education minister, raising some questions about your leadership. How do you think the public's feeling about your administration right now? Well, let's talk about the budget, shall we? Because it was a, a key budget. It was the right budget um, for, for this particular point in, in the administration. It was the budget that supported the island plan. It supported uh, our economic growth plans, but it also made a critical readjustment in terms of our public services and started to address this critical issue around health and social care funding. Let me just go back to those uh, opening comments, uh, generic comments, I, I would suggest, from um, Phil Gorn. Uh, but I think one of the issues here is this: just this picture that's been painted. This was a budget that just attacked everybody. That's not, that's not true, right? I mean, a lot of people will be a lot better off as a result of this budget. Yes, those people are, are perhaps the, the less well off in society. We've made a lot of adjustments so that we are ensuring that everybody is going to benefit from the future economic growth of the island. A pen, and let me, I need to make this clear because this picture being painted that everybody's worse off. It's not true. If you're a state pensioner on the state pension, you're £979 better off next year as a result of this budget. If you're a pensioner and your income's 45,000, household income 45,000, you're 283 pounds better off. If you're a jointly assessed couple, right, two children, and you've got an income uh, of around 50,000 a year, you're gonna be 454 pounds better off because of this budget. If you're a single parent on 30,000 pounds, uh, working full time and, and in receipt of the child benefit, you're gonna be 1,400 pounds better off next year as a result of this budget because the increases that what we've done and those adjustments that the Treasury Minister has made to support working families in particular, but families generally with the uplifts in child benefit and the equalization of, of the rates, will mean that a lot of people, working people who are out working, uh, supporting businesses, but finding life tough because of their, you know, because of the costs of childcare, etc. Uh, and we've also got the childcare strategy, I'm sure we'll come on to that, will be better off as a result of this, this, this budget. Yes, because of the readjustments, because of the investment in health and social care, and we need to make that investment because health and social care is absolutely vital, a well, a well run, well-integrated, advancing service is, is absolutely vital for the future success of the island. So some people will be worse off, but we've had to make, but not by a huge amount once you do the figures, and yes, the further up the chain you go, there is a bit more, more impact. But this was a balanced budget in terms of that impact, and a lot of people, a lot of families, because of what we've done, uh, and the Treasury Minister's done with, with some of those benefits, child benefits, are going to be better off. So let's be clear about this, that this is a budget for everybody on the island because it focuses in the right areas in terms of our, our, our growing um, demand on health and social care. But it also helps a lot of families who are struggling at the moment because of the cost of living. Phil? Well, I, all I was doing was saying what people are saying and Perhaps they're saying that because government's communication in relation to these matters hasn't been as clear as it needs to be. I think this is why the budget does need a lot of analysis because I think there were quite a lot, a lot of moving parts to it. And I'm, you know, one of the reasons why I'm pleased with, with the Treasury Minister to be here today is because we can get down into um, the detail of, of this analysis. And I hope a lot of people will be pleased to hear what I'm, you know, what I am saying in terms of this analysis, and I'm, uh, you know, I'm, I'm absolutely happy. I'm sure for some of these figures to be released because actually this view that somehow everybody's going to be paying more tax is just incorrect. Because what the Treasury has done, in line with the island plan and aligned with what Council's pressing for, is to ensure that we are that this growth, this economic growth, is one that everybody can can share in, and and that it's not just targeted you know, for those who are in the best positions to, 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 to benefit from it. Sorry, but, but, No, 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 talk, but, but also, uh, Phil, when you say everyone's saying, you're talking about social media, and I would advocate that in this nation, like any other nation, social media is one point of view. I'm more interested in what the audience have to say, what your listeners have to say today, rather than anonymous tweets 
um, to be honest with you, because they tend to be negative and go around an echo chamber, whether that's about the healthcare service, the public servants the, who work in, in, in if for government, public sector workers as a whole, or our economy. And I think there is a lot of negatives, in, you know, negative sentiment out there, absolutely, that's reflected and pinned onto the budget. But go, what I'd like to do over the course of this programme is go below some of the headlines and look at the detail of this budget. It's a really quite detailed document. We try to explain that and hopefully by this programme we'll be able to do that a little bit better. Well, let's uh, get to that in a moment, but let's just meet the rest of our panel. The Chief Executive of Manx Care, Theresa Cope, is also with us this afternoon. A significant budget for Manx Care, the money raised by the tax increase being ring-fenced for health, but a stark warning from the Chief Minister in Timwald that Manx Care must operate within those financial constraints now or that investment will have to stop. What was your reaction to that? I think we acknowledge that position. Um, you know, we always intend to set a balanced budget and we, uh, we will be able to do that this year. Um, I welcome the additional investment that we have seen. Um, as I say, it will allow us to commit to that ongoing transformation. And I think the key word here is sustainability. We need to have sustainable services that we can then build on um, in terms of delivering high quality health care. We've been through a year last year of being regulated by the Care Quality Commission and Ofsted and our children's services. Um, they set very clear parameters about the standards that we need to achieve and Manx Care are really committed to delivering against that. Um, and, you know, the mandate from the department this year puts that real strong focus on transformation, on developing our out-of-hospital services and our infrastructure. And that's what we welcome because being able to follow through on the recommendations of Sir Jonathan Michael's report of 2019 is absolutely what we want to see. The focus on early intervention as outlined in the island plan. You know, these are all things we know we need. Um, and I think for, for Manx Care, being able to set realistic budgets for our services going into 2024-25, to be able to put um, what we would consider to be a reasonable pay award on the table at the earliest opportunity for our, for our workforce and be able to deliver that tangible benefits. My job over the next 12 months as I see it is to really demonstrate we are using the Manx Pound as effectively as possible. And we're talking in a week when the emergency department, for example, has issued notices about being extremely busy. We know that some of the overnight meds provision during the week has had to be scaled back. What will the public see? What tangible things will they see in terms of emergency care, for example, as a result of this funding? So, you know, I think one of the um, matters, and that's why we talk about things like the OPAL framework, it's really important we describe accurately when we are under pressure. Um, and, you know, that didn't happen before. So all of the things we are doing in the out-of-hospital space, you know, the work we are doing with the ambulance service to be able to not convey people to the emergency department all of the time is really, really important work. Building the intermediate tier, that really important tier which sits between primary care and secondary care is really important because we know we take too many patients to the emergency department. We know we need to create other diversionary pathways. We need to create local well-being hubs and for them to have the services linked to them which allows people to stay well in their own communities for as long as possible. So you know we have invested heavily. You know last year half a million pounds extra went into emergency department staffing. Um, and we have placed a real strong focus on reducing delayed transfers of care in hospital to the point where now we are talking about single figures. Whereas I think if you compare that to anywhere else, that is a really strong barometer that we've got good flow through our services. But we definitely need to invest now and the time is right for increased services out in the community, which keeps our hospital for hospital based services. Also on our panel, Chair of the Max Technology Group and former Economic Advisor John Webster. Your thoughts on the budget 2024, Mr Webster? Uh, my, my, my first, uh, I think my first point would be a question. I recognise that we do need um, more money. Uh, one of the reasons is uh, government expenditure has been increasing rapidly over the last uh, 10 years. Um, uh, my problem with how they're doing it is that we've... Stability today is very important, particularly with the changing world and the 
greatly changing Isle of Man. And the 20% rate of tax has been one of the cornerstones of us selling the Isle of Man overseas. My question is really, why did we not introduce the health charge now to raise the 20 million pounds rather than increase the rate of income tax? Because once you've increased the rate, you've lost that stability and produced uncertainty. And certainty in the business world is very important, which leads me to the next point. There seems to be a disconnect between balancing the books for the Treasury's financial position and the, the real economy. Um, if you if you outside and talk to people about what's happening in the real economy, it's miles away from government. And one of the selling points we used to make very strongly was that the private and public sectors in the Isle of Man had a very good relationship. That relationship seems to have been uh, shattered and there's an increasing gulf between the real world and the financial world of the Treasury. A simple example is that the national income statistics are now four years out of date. Now how can you run an economy when an essential piece of information like the national income statistics are four years late? Treasury Minister? Yeah, you've got th three questions there. So the, why, they, why the GDP figures out of date? There have been issues, obviously, with the creation of Statistics Isle of Man and getting that data. There's always a slight time lag, but they are confident that they're going to be catching up on that and getting some of the data out there in the, in, the, in the public. But I agree with you that we need that accurate data. In terms of working with the private sector, I disagree with you because actually what we've done through the Department for Enterprise, through the agency model, through the amount of interaction with a whole range of different voices in the private sector is extremely impressive and ongoing, as well as working with um, worker representatives in terms of the public sector as well to get that holistic idea of the Isle of Man economy which is incredibly diverse and resilient. But I agree with you that what we need and what I think this budget and the, the future budgets that will lead on from it give is that certainty, sustainability and stability. Now, looking at the increase in the upper rate of income tax by 2% and why we didn't bring in a health care levy beforehand, health care levy is slightly more complicated and certainly would take the primary legislation to bring through that we will develop with Timwald members once we debate the, um, the tax strategy. It's something that we've looked into in terms of other jurisdictions and Jersey have got a social care levy and then have reduced their, rate, their top rate of income tax in terms of the headline figure, in terms of advertising that. And we can model what we want to do on similar basis. But what a health care levy does is allow us to um, put a levy on people who live on the Isle of Man who don't actually pay tax here. And so broaden out that base in terms of income coming in. I, I would love to have brought that straight in, but we do need to work with Timbal members and our community so that they can understand something that would be new to the island, but has been used quite successfully in other jurisdictions. We'll come back to you in one second, Mr. Webster, because I just want to introduce Pam Harvey, who's a director from Crow Isle of Man, making up the panel. Uh, Pam, your overall assessment of the budget? So um, I think this budget includes more changes to the income tax regime than we've seen for in recent years. Um, it sees the first increase in the high rate of income tax since 2010. Um, and my question is, is does this, the, the effect of these changes align to the island plan to increase the population? Um, is the island still an attractive place to relocate to for the people that we are terming the squeezed middle? Um, I appreciate that the Chief Minister spoke about um, a couple with an income of £50,000 being £454 a year better off, and I think that's better off than last year, is that correct? With children. With children, so okay. So if we took an individual with no children um, and compared them from here to the UK, which I think um, Mr Ashford did in, um, in Timwald on Tuesday, and he said that they would be £454 a year better off from a tax point of view if they were here than in the UK. But if you add the national insurance onto that, are they still better off here or are they not better off in the UK if we include national insurance and take home their net take home, what's going in their pocket? Are we still better off? And then furthermore, the tax, tax strategy document, it talks about a fairness review um, in terms of national insurance and owner-managed businesses. Um, could this be looking to introduce national insurance on dividends? And if this is the case, what worry does this bring to our current um, potentially 
current and potentially new owner-managed businesses and entrepreneurs, again, people that we're trying to encourage to move to the Isle of Man, and our clients who are asking us this question, they're now feeling uncertain and where do they go to next? If I, if I could just answer that, that second point, as you're probably aware, we went out for consultation on the National Insurance Fund, particularly looking at the way dividends on owner-managed businesses are, um, are treated. And overwhelmingly, the feedback was that, that we wanted a fairer system. In terms, I think you make a very good point in terms of the overall tax burden on people moving over here from the UK. Um, we have a very competitive rate of, of income tax, but our national insurance rates are different. The thresholds are different. Um, and that's why we've also brought in a review of the national insurance system as a whole, because it would certainly be my intention to look at that again, to get the national insurance scheme far more sustainable. We've had the government actuary department in the UK um, do the forecast to say that if we do nothing, the NI fund is at risk of being extinguished by 47, 48. We need to make some changes there to actually have a sustainable NI system going forward. And that's why in the budget speech on Tuesday, I said we really need to look at the break of the triple lock to sustain people's pensions going forward, but also make sure that those working people who are currently paying into the fund get a fair deal as well in terms of intergenerational fairness. So I think we are competitive. When you look at somebody on a median income coming over um, here, they are the, that disparity between what they pay in tax and NI combined in the Isle of Man as opposed to the UK is narrowing. But by what we've done in terms of putting money into child benefits and also child care, I think we can turn that around. And also we do need to make sure that when we're marketing the Isle of Man, we do it as a complete package. It is not just about tax. It is about the standard of living here. It is about the quality public services, particularly education and health care that you can get on the Isle of Man and the safety aspect of this. And this is why this is a budget looking at one much wider rather than a headline figure of tax in terms of what will not only bring people over to the Isle of Man, but more importantly, perhaps, than what will keep them here and make sure we can provide those services for the residents we have here already. It's interesting, though, isn't it? I think it's how people feel. And um, we are getting a lot of reaction from people who don't feel that they're better off. And we may be able to, to look at the figures more in depth. But I just want to uh, bring a text here from David, who says, how is a pensioner £960 better off if you take into account inflation, gas and electric bills, fuel for vehicles and heating oil? A pensioner is worse off because of this budget. The, a pensioner, the, the, the things that your, your listener has commented on, and I thank them for getting in contact, are actually nothing to do with the budget. I mean, we're talking about coming out of an inflationary period where things, have, where things have gone up. We're talking about gas prices, electricity prices, which are now beginning to come down, oil prices, which are now beginning to come down, and general inflation. What we need to do with this budget is actually rebase what governments spend, but also support people like your listener in terms of, pe of pensioners. And actually, when you look at some of the other schemes that are available there in terms of energy efficiency, particularly looking at elderly people, particularly on their own. They are helping them actually adapt to what we've all been through over the last couple of years. Are they easy enough to access, though? We'll, again, you can, you can never over-publicise some of the schemes that we're doing, but by doing programmes like this, um, we can hopefully show that there are a whole range of schemes available for pensioners to help them deal with things like energy prices and energy costs. DEFRA are still promoting those now. And what we'd like to say is, is if anyone that is struggling at all, please reach out to either Social Security or to various other government services that are there. There is a lot of help there. Sometimes it's people feel proud and don't want to access it. Sometimes they're not aware of it. But again, we will constantly say that we will do as much as possible to help those people out who are struggling because of the overall inflationary period we're going through. Chief Minister? Yeah, I mean, listen, I mean, pe people are under pressure. Government's under pressure. We've had COVID. We've had a war in Ukraine. We've seen energy prices spiking. We've seen inflation spiking. You know, we've seen changes to interest rates. You know, there has, there undoubtedly, and this probably goes to part of what John is inferring, but, you know, this cost squeeze has impacted us all and it's impacted on, on government. The worst thing that this government could have done would have been to support a Treasury Minister in, 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 in a sort of frugal budget, in an austerity budget, because what we have, instead, what we have done, to come back to your listener, I mean, 
you know, Alex can't control the inflationary costs. We can try and respond the best that we can, and we have to respond, but we have to respond responsibly. This year, I mean, I noticed the energy prices are dropping back down, right? We've seen a cut in electricity bills. We've seen gas bills starting to, to, to come down. Inflation is steadying. You know, putting money back into uh, an economy where we are targeting families and pensioners who are less well off is the right thing to do. And these figures need to come out because this is not an austerity attack or, sorry, a tax attack on the whole, um, the, the, the nation at all. And in fact, you know, a lot of that impact is not that much, really, when you, you, you analyze it. I appreciate for hard-pressed families. But when I came in in 2016, I came into a, to a nation that was divided. We had had five years of austerity. Families were in poverty. I mean it. In my own constituency, I, I saw it. And, and the correction that we needed to do by investing and putting the money into supporting everybody to take the nation with us is better for business than having deep cuts or deep freezes that, that, uh, that, that, that damage economic standing, that damage social progress. And we've, there's got a balance to be had. But let's move away from it's all just about the, the, the tax because we have to take a society and you have to build a nation that takes and builds economic success for everybody. I agree, it's not all about the tax, but and you can't control those external things, absolutely. Some people would say that your government could control its spending, which in some projects has gone wildly overboard. I, I agree, there are projects, you know, okay, I mean, you know, there have been government capital projects, okay, but let's not, let's, uh, which have not gone to plan. And I agree that, that you know, some of the, 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 the management and the way they've progressed has not been ideal. But I've also, and we've got to get to the bottom of it, there's been COVID impacts, there's been inflation impacts, there's been a lot of other issues attached to those capital projects. But yes, controlling spending is a major issue. And that is why, you know, the Treasury Minister and I and a council, and you'll see in our island plan, that a priority for us in the next 12 months is financial discipline. Uh, and we aim to enforce that strongly uh, uh, across the board because there is absolutely a need for government now to get its costs under control despite all these other pressures that are around us. I would say maybe some people think that's possibly too late. You're nearing the end of the administration by then. But Phil, let's come to you. Yeah, we've got lots of uh, questions now uh, springing up from the audience. And uh, we start off with Debbie Halsell from Unite the Union. Hi, I am a representative of both the private and the public sector. You sit there and say, you know, there's efficiencies to be made, blah, blah, blah. Two and a half years in your tenure, you still haven't done what you set out to do. You keep waffling, excuse my words, about the island plan. How can you attract anybody to come here when basically you've created a drag economy? You've done nothing. There is no accountability. And you still keep going on about what you are planning to do. So tell us, because while I represent, there's been 600 plus Local businesses have shut because of the strains and you have done nothing. So while you sit there and say you've got the finger on the pulse, you certainly haven't got it from where we sit and from our members. And to be honest, the question that's been rising is, when are you going to resign, Chief Minister? Well, thanks. nice to hear a union boss uh, really recognising the, uh, the optimism that is actually out in, in the island because we've got 700 more people on the employment register. Income tax receipts are up. We've got an extensive building programme going on uh, across the, the private sector. We're changing the outlook for, for the public sector by creating the housing association. We're developing our brownfield sites. Many of your members who are earning and, and we've seen good wage increases across the public sector, which have outstripped the private sector, by the way. Uh, we've put away the strikes. We've recovered the, the, the education uh, sector. We're off, off the uh, hindrance of uh, working time and work to rule. We've recovered the situation. We're away from strikes in, in, in the healthcare sector. And we are improving and delivering this island. What we need to do is to ensure that the unions are contributing efficiently and effectively. And I thank those unions that have acted positively alongside to help us resolve some of the, uh, the, the negativity that, that existed. So we've taken the island forward in a huge number of uh, areas. And we can see from this budget that we are supporting the lower paid in society and helping them overcome some of the cost challenges that exist. 
So this government has been delivering, it's been delivering for two and a half years and it's going to keep on delivering for the next two and a half years. Can I also just say that one of the key things that um, John Webster was talking about is sustainability and stability. One of the key reasons people invest in the Isle of Man is a sense of political stability. So I do think that calls on the basis of a budget for various people to resign are unhelpful. What we need to do is actually get together, both public and private sectors, as we are doing, to make sure that we all have a common goal in terms of long-term plan to grow the prosperity of this island and to invest in people and those key public services that will keep them here and also that they not only demand but deserve. And Ger Geraldine O'Neill, and I forget which union. NAS UWT. Hi. Um, I would just like to say we certainly do want to be involved in positive um, engagement with government. However, you mentioned their engagement with unions, both of you. We've had little or no engagement. We've had tokenism. For example, you talked about you have a tax strategy. Well, I'm asking you now, on behalf of trade unions and the Isle of Man TUC, invite us to your talks about your tax strategy. Invite us to put our input in there. When are we going to see a tax strategy that looks at the high level income people who are paying a rate that is not the same impact for them as those who are in the squeeze middle. I represent the squeeze middle, and I'm sorry, Chief Minister, they exist. And just as you've given your examples, I'll be very happy to go to our members and give you examples back how the squeeze middle is less well off. And I think I will do that in the next couple of weeks. I will be seeing our members next week, and they'll be more than happy to give you the information on the squeeze middle. We're, all, we're talking here about a better island future. Well, if you're going to attract the people who are going to deliver essential services, which are, you've mentioned health and education, then you have to be doing more at that level to keep those people here. You've, you've given statistics there, but you, again, as this lady pointed out, you're talking about people with dependents. I have no dependents. I'm a widow. I'm worse off at every single budget. Worse off. And I'm quite sure there are many in my position here on the Isle of Man, whether they're single with no partner or whether they're widow or widower. So really, um, Dr. Allenson, I do hope that when you say you want to engage, that you actually do that. We're involved with the Isle of Man TUC, we're involved with the Industrial Relations Forum, but we're not seeing that we have any input into anything. I want to see professionals come here and work here. I want to see this island prosper. But you have to listen to us as well and see what are the pressures that are driving people off this island. Because I can tell you at the moment, they are being driven off this island. Okay. I mean, I mean th thank you um, very much for your input. And obviously, we've worked together when I was in education. And I understand that there are regular meetings between the various unions representing teachers and the department. What we're doing in terms of the taxation strategy that you commented on is it is coming to Timwald for a full debate in March, and then we will be taking that debate out further. You talk about high net worths and tax caps, and that was brought up during the budget debate as well in terms of something we need to review. But again, we'd we were talking about with the tax cap dealing with probably only about 50 or 60 people nowadays. So we do need to look at how we can be attractive to people of all backgrounds, all, all um, wealths that can come and be part of our community but also put into that community. But I would like to say I think you would recognise that the efforts that have been made by the Education Department over the last couple of years in terms of working with the unions, in terms of pay and conditions, and particularly working conditions, have been successful in terms of recruitment and retention, particularly for some of those key younger teachers that we need to come in. Um, if you feel otherwise, then please talk to the department because I've talked to the department in terms of the number of vacancies on this island, and it is remarkably low, particularly when you compare that to the adjacent island, some of those key areas such as maths and the sciences. John well, Webster? I'm, I'm frankly gobsmacked, actually, by that, those, those statements, because this is a government that, in this budget, has just put another £18 million into education to support you and your members, has raised child benefit significantly to such an extent that a single mum on a low wage is £1,400 better off under this government that has raised the thresholds for, start, for teachers starting at the lowest levels.
that has given your members quite significant pay rises that the public is going to have to pay for, and you're sitting there, and we've added to the working, the working role and continue to invest in the critical services of health and education, I, I frankly find that an amazing uh, outburst from you. But Chief Minister, is, is the problem that you're not hearing what people are saying? I mean, this no. isn't just coming from uh, Geraldine O'Neill there. There are people saying you're not hearing us, you're not hearing our point of view. There is a cost of living crunch. We absolutely recognise that. Government, uh, the island along with just about everywhere else in the world, uh, but particularly in the Northern Hemisphere, has had a cost of living crunch. It has squeezed incomes, right? It has cost business pressures on their top and bottom lines, uh, and it has cost government, and it has cost, it has cost the public sector. Our reaction to, to retrench and give an austerity budget would have been the absolute worst thing possible. We carry on investing, we're creating jobs, we're creating opportunity. The investment we're putting into brownfield sites will keep the building trade, the construction trade going for years. The opportunities we're creating through defined housing programs will keep people in work for years and years to come. There are massive opportunities over here. The fact is we are all squeezed because of the costs have gone up so much and inflation uh, and COVID and the crunch has really, has really hit a lot of people. But if it was bad, unemployment would be streaking away. When I came into, into politics, it was 1,300 people were unemployed on this island and people were struggling. Okay, people are struggling now, but these types of investments, year on year, we've looked at child benefit and helped to equalize the situation. So let's be absolutely clear. I appreciate there is a cost of living crunch. I appreciate families are under pressure. The cost of a basket of goods is, is difficult when you go and do, do your weekly shopping. We're not unaware of these challenges, but the best thing we can do to solve this, to take people forward, is to continue to invest in those public services and continue to invest to drive the private sector forward. And I hear what people, it's important, no, sorry, it's important that I, you know, we get the facts out and not just the sound bites here. Because when you say there are businesses, I'm fully cognizant of businesses closing. There's as many businesses opening as there are closing, I'm afraid to say, in many of these uh, areas. And actually, as I said, the payroll, the government employment trackers, are showing that we've got 700 people more in work than we had at the start of this administration. So let's be clear about the negativity. Actually, there's a huge amount of positivity out there. And, look, and it's right, because if we, if we saw people falling out into unemployment, if we saw families um, you know, reduced uh, because of the, 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 the children aspect into, into poverty, then they, it would make a huge negative impact over here. And that's why, why some of these investments, particularly that child benefit investment, is right and going to benefit so many people on this island. John Webster. Uh, thank you. It's, uh, it's important to get some facts behind this. Um, everything is not brilliant, uh, and government, I think, is wrong to keep asserting that it is. If, if you, we're not asserting that. Uh, can I, do you mind if I have a few words? I think you've spoken quite extensively, Elf. Um, the, in the absence of the national income statistics, I did some basic research, because you have to do that nowadays. And what, one is, what's happening to national insurance arrears? They've gone up to almost a million pounds. You know this, that your own arrears are increasing dramatically. Yeah. A million pounds out of what total? It's gone up uh, a, a million pounds out of what four total? times over the last yeah. few years. What's the percentage of total? But that's irrelevant. No, no, it isn't irrelevant. You're still okay, talking let, about yeah. a tiny percentage of the total take. Why don't you two politicians allow people to give some facts? Yeah. Yeah. And actually have opinions. You're, you're sat there and, you know, it, it, it's just rhetoric. It, it's, there's no basic, there's no logic, no, 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 this, and there's very little. This is a written Tim Wald question you're, you're quoting from, which I, which I gave. So I, I think I do know the facts on that in terms of national, national insurance arrears. And did they or did they not go up? They did go four. up, but yeah, you've got to put right. that in context. Right. Okay, I'll give you another piece of information. I, I was out the other day, and I said to someone, how's your business going? He said, it's absolutely booming. I said, oh, that's good news. He said, do you know what I mean? I said, no, liquidation. 
He's liquidating lots of companies in the construction industry and in catering in particular. And one of the problems that a lot of people on the island are facing, particularly the unions, is that people are being brought in on visas and very low pay, which is reducing the ability of the unions to negotiate. You've basically under, undermined their negotiating power. So instead of allowing uh, wages to increase in the private sector, they're being undermined by the number of people coming in. Furthermore, if you look at another statistic which the government produces, the, the level of wages in the private sector are £20 a week less. And they work one and a half hours more and they don't have the pension benefits of the public sector. So that is one of the reasons the, the poor people on the island are concerned about what's happening. If you look at another factor, again from the government statistics, the latest population report produced by Statistics Alderman, I think, show that the population will not reach the target and uh, the number in the working population will remain static. In fact, the uh, people over the age of pension will be 27% compared with 23% now. So the idea of the plan to increase to 100,000 isn't actually working. It's making the, dem the demographics worse and it's continuing to impose um, more pressure on the uh, health and other services, which is one of the reasons you need to increase the rate of income tax. It's a vicious downward circle. Briefly, uh, Treasury Minister. Yeah, I, I, and thank you for quoting facts. Um, so you were quoting from the other man earnings survey report published in 2022. The, the latest one will be published later on um, this spring. So you're quite right when you compare private and public pay, all, all um, male and female, in terms of manual workers, private, in the private sector, £600 a week on average, um, and the public sector at £678. But there is the, the small print under that is that the private and public sector workforces are composed quite differently. Consequently, differences in weekly earnings do not reveal differences in rates of pay for comparable jobs. For example, many of the lowest paid occupations, such as bar and restaurant staff, hairdressers, elementary, elementary sales occupations and cashiers, exist primarily in the private sector. So you have to drill down to the details of that before you have, make sweeping statements. And the reality is what this government is about is raising the medium wage for all people on this island. That's what we're doing. And I had to ask, answer questions about the delays in the minimum wage going forward and the ongoing commitment to, to merging that with a living wage as well. So we can actually increase the wages of all the people on this island while still making sure we have the prosperity to invest in businesses and for some of those businesses that you're talking about to actually prosper. I agree. You do have to drill down. And one of the statistics we've heard on many occasions is that 700 new jobs have been created. What jobs are they? Who are they? H and how do they compare with the jobs which we are losing? Briefly, Chief Minister. Well, you know, there's lies, damn lies, and statistics. My, my, the bigger point is we have an economic plan. We're clear about our economic plan. It's good to hear the criticisms, but I aren't, I'm not hearing any solutions because, you know, people like Mr. Webster, they're constantly criticising government shouldn't be growing the population. We don't want any more people on the island and yet they have no alternative to offer. We are doing, we are driving forward, we are a government with a plan, with an economic plan, and we know and believe that we are driving the island forward, not just for demographic issues, but also because it will give business opportunities for the future and give our children opportunities. Are you sure I'm then, Chief here. Minister, no, are no, you no, sure, I, no, sorry, are you sure that you are bringing people along with you with well, this plan? Hang on. Hang on. Beth, I need no, to be clear about, people no, but are, hang on, it takes time for things to develop through, but also let's be clear, you know, people like John Webster and his, and others in the ill have stood for years ago, there's no vibrancy on the island, there's nothing happening, you know, the children are leaving. We are determined to start tackling that, building be a better island, right, where, where actually more people create more opportunities for business, create more sustainability, create more vibrancy done in the right way. You know, and, and we are focused, it, focused on driving that forward. Now, there are lots of problems attached to that. I am not saying that this is a problem-free strategy 
because alongside it, you've got to increase your infrastructure, you've got to make the right people available, you've got to invest in things like childcare, for example, to make sure that, that uh, you know, we've got the facilities available to cope, but we have got a strategy. What I'm interested in is what are the other, what other options? You know, standing still was not an option. We'll come back to you in a moment, John, but Theresa Cope, I just want to bring you in here. Could I just say, I am prepared to give other options, but no one will listen. We'll come to those in a minute. Theresa Cope? Yeah, so I wanted just to give a perspective from health, really, and it is a narrow field, but I guess the, the first thing people look at when they're coming to work in health and care on the island is the standard of health care. So everyone looks at the CQC report and the Ofsted report, and people will make a decision whether to come and work on the island based on the current standard of, of health and care services. Um, it's a very active market. Um, people doctors, nurses, physiotherapists, occupational therapists have the choice of where they want to work. So it is about being competitive and it is about being able to say the quality of services here is good um, and there is an integrated health and care system. And I think this is where Manx Care has had some success. So sustainable health and care is about reducing our reliance on agency workers and being able to have an establishing committed workforce that stays here. Um, so we have to put a lot of effort into retention, but we have been able to reduce our agency spend in the last year by two million pounds. Um, we have been able to recruit to the majority of the posts we have gone out to advert for. We have been able to recruit and attract people from the UK NHS who are having a really tricky time. So for some of those doctors and nurses and registered professionals, we are a very attractive option. Where we have the difficulty, and this is where our plans are evolving, is the non-registered workforce. So we need to have a very clear career progression plan and fair pay for, for non-registered workforces, which is why we are expanding the number of nurse training places, increasing the bursary, and being able to offer that career path and fair pay for non-registered non workforce. So in the context of that debate, I just wanted to offer some, some positivity, actually, about where we are really having positive impact and we can see the benefit. It's not all... It's not all great by any stretch of the imagination, but I am really encouraged that bringing experts to the island in health and care, we have been able to do that, and we can evidence the benefit of that on, on, on our finances. Phil? Well, I think uh, just about everybody in the room wants to ask a question now, but uh, if we come next to Isle of Man Chamber of Commerce, uh, can you? Hi, John Hunter, Isle of Man Chamber of Commerce. Clearly a very difficult budget particularly in the challenges we've faced over the last few years. Very, very important that we do support our essential services of healthcare, education and infrastructure. However, one thing that's coming through strongly from our members is what is the government strategy for reducing the cost of government, particularly in non-essential functions? You know, is the government telling us that actually before going to the taxpayer, they've done a forensic examination and there aren't any cost savings that can be made in government? We obviously have to provide as much value for money as the taxpayer as, as possible. You will know, uh, along with everybody else, that there are a number of work streams underway where we are looking at services and how those services can be shaped you know, for, for the future. Um, uh, for example, I will take that, that the housing as a particular example, the creation of a housing association where we would effectively fund and operate at arm's length, but you know, under its own steam effectively without the necessarily the need um, for, for, for government subsidies, uh, an arm's length operation which would not only provide all the social housing uh, that we need, but also set out, have the ability to create first time buyer opportunities and various other supports for, for low, low to middle income earners who need, needed that housing. That would certainly take, you know, effic create efficiencies um, for government. Uh, you know, I think uh, the Treasury Minister has been very careful in terms of the rest. Of the, I mean, we've talked about health and education. You've got to remember, I think it is important that we put into context the level of investment that has gone into the health service. And when you look at the growth in numbers, and I know a lot of people say, well, you, the government's growing, it's getting bigger. Well, one, I would point out that the islands are hopefully also getting bigger, and the evidence that we have is that, that, that it is getting bigger, but also I think that the investment into health services has meant that we have been investing in terms of personnel in, into those areas. 
but the controls that have been been allocated, you know, the, 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 the very strict budgetary allocation that has been given out across the rest of the um, government will lead to departments having to find efficiencies. And, you know, certainly, I mean, uh, I really should hand over to the Treasury Minister, but, you know, that is one mechanism where we do drive that efficiency by ensuring that allocations are kept to, 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 their, to their minimum. Yeah, so I, I give, thank you, Chief Minister. I mean, in terms of cost improvement programs, I think Manx Care were leading those in terms of having it baked into their budget and having to deliver. We've been, what we've been doing is broadening that out to all departments. The other aspects are in terms of investing in the Office of Human Resources, doing proper work planning, seeing how many staff we need and what grades of staff we need to provide those services and also the amount of investment we're putting into automation and new technologies to drive those efficiencies in terms of both providing a better service to, to the public but also hopefully making what we do a lot more efficient. But again, that's balanced also with providing good service and the increasing demands on government to provide that service right across the piece, whether that's making sure that visas can be you know, um, provided a lot quicker, working with work permits to get that a lot quicker and dealing with the individual individual um, needs of the people on the Isle of Man. You mentioned communication earlier about perhaps there's a communication disconnect between government and the public. I think that you need to make clear to the public and to businesses where those cost savings are coming from. I can share with you now that 96% of the online respondees to the Chamber of Commerce survey don't support the budget. Okay. They well, actually I, say it's bad I, for business. I, I, so I, I, if we can, I think we've got to change the rhetoric here. If, if you're talking about cost savings and efficiencies in government, that needs to be shared with us so we understand. Well, I, I mean, I had a meeting with the Chamber last, last Monday and we went through some of the things we're, we're doing within government. Again, you're, you're quite right, the comms are really important, but that's why events like this are really important to get underneath the headlines. That's why the Chief Minister has committed to the, the Island Conference each year and actually going out there. And I don't know any other jurisdiction that, that actually gets all the ministers up on a stage to take questions. This is one of the most, I think, open governments we've ever seen far more reactive, far more able to talk both to businesses and individuals on this island to get their feedback. But at the end of the day, it's our duty to put that into a coherent plan and programme going forward. And I think by, do, by having, having that ad adequate um, communications, we can move forward together. But if we're going to talk about cost savings, we've got to have the data and the evidence behind it. Manx Care have, individual departments have, and what we will try to do is publish that and get those facts out. Lots more to talk about. Uh, we are here for the next hour. Unfortunately, the Chief Minister has to leave us. Oh, he's going to stay till half one now. He's having such a good time. Uh, it is lovely to get your thoughts. 166177 studio at manxradio.com. We will get to uh, some of your texts and emails in the second part of the programme. Just a reminder, you can watch live at manxradio.com and on the Manx Radio uh, YouTube channel as well. And we do have an audience here who have got a lot of questions and uh, we will get to some of those in the next hour. But you are listening to Manx Radio's special budget programme brought to you by Crow Isle of Man. It is coming up to to one o'clock and the news will be next. Tax and accounts feel like a grey cloud above your head. <sighs> Step into the sunshine with Crow Isle of Man. Our friendly team of chartered accountants take time to listen to your business needs and work with you to prepare for the future. From tax and accounts to audit and payroll, our track record of quality and client satisfaction speaks for itself. Visit crow.im or call 627335. Crow Isle of Man. Smart decisions. Lasting value. There's monkeys and meerkats, penguins galore. You can meet with a panda, owls, lemurs, and more. It's half term, and the Curax Wildlife Park is open every day. So book your tickets and experiences online now at curaxwildlifepark.im. Business owners, if you're looking to get involved in a great local cause, then find out about the Queen's Pier Restoration Trust. Opportunities include helping out and discovery days for staff, along with sponsorship opportunities to help with the restoration. Call Graham on 355 104 to discuss the corporate support options available to keep this historic Manx landmark for future generations. Call Graham today on 355 104. This audio has been kindly sponsored by Paul Carey and Sons. <laughs> 
I wish I had a better savings account. Did you hear about Skipton International's great rates for their savings accounts? No, tell me more. Skipton are currently offering a 5% AER fixed rate account maturing 14th of March 2025. Wow, that's a really good deal. It's no wonder Guernsey's bank Skipton International offers some of the best rates around. For details of all Skipton savings products, call 01481 730 730 or visit skiptoninternational.com. It's time to switch to Skipton. No withdrawals allowed until maturity. Interest is paid annually and upon maturity. Skipton International is licensed to take deposits by the GFSC and is a participant in the Guernsey Banking Deposit Compensation Scheme. See dcs.gg. There are loads of savers at ShopRite. Nescafe Azira Coffee, 90 grams, just £3.35. A great range of Heinz soup, any five cans for £5. ShopRite Savers, in store now. Manx Radio's budget coverage. Brought to you by Crow Isle of Man. And that coverage will continue after one o'clock, but now it is time for the news with Christian Jones, Fastamai Christian. Fastamai, the Treasury Minister has been defending his budget as it's being scrutinised by other politicians, businesses and field experts. Alex Allenson insists his pink book is a budget for the Isle of Man, which feeds into goals set out in the government's island plan. Politicians have previously made calls for reforms to the process of setting out government finances to allow more time for scrutiny. During Manx Radio's budget special, Dr Allenson was asked if he would consider allowing MHKs to vote on it in part. What I think this government is absolutely committed to do is deliver um, for the Isle of Man people. The budget actually funds that. Now what we've done is try to expand the budget process so that members get get the details of the budget a lot earlier. They're allowed to, you know, ask to come to Treasury, discuss the various par parts of it. They do get a chance to vote on it separately. Meanwhile, it looks as though the Chief Minister's leadership is being tested following his decision to sack Julie Edge from her ministerial role. Ms Edge believes there were underhand operations at play when Alfred Cannon made what he describes as a strategic mid-term change and subsequently instated Daphne Kane as the Education Minister. But there are inque increasing questions surrounding his future, but he didn't seem keen on speaking about it this lunchtime. How do you think the public's feeling about your administration right now? Well, let's talk about the budget, shall we? Because it was a, a key budget, it was the right budget. Ensuring enough taxes raised to meet the island's needs, having a fair and equitable tax system and complying with international tax standards. Those are the three main aims identified by Treasury in its 2024-26 tax strategy. Sean Cowper has the details. The document also sets out seven priority actions, including implementing a minimum effective tax rate of 15% for multinational enterprises, addressing fairness in relation to national insurance, and future incentives to promote productivity and increase the economically active population. The review says Treasury will not introduce new taxes on capital or wealth, but will investigate ways to broaden the tax base. A consultation on incentives to promote growth of the economically active population is scheduled for winter, with the political decisions due to be set out in next year's budget. Farmers on the Isle of Man are being encouraged to ask for help with loneliness and mental health issues that may arise while at work. A study by the Farm Safety Foundation revealed that 95% of farmers under 40 believe mental health is the biggest hidden problem facing farmers today. Plans to build 133 new homes in Douglas is being recommended for approval. The Manx Development Corporation hopes its Westmoreland Village proposal will allow shops and businesses to thrive. And two pupils from Bunskol Galga are heading to Scotland today for the Film G Alba Short Film Awards in Glasgow. Cara Rolls and fellow filmmaker Olivia Savage, along with their other classmates, helped write, shoot, perform, edit and play the music for their film The Dam. In international news now, Anne Downing Street has welcomed a Court of Appeals decision to dismiss Shemima Begum's legal challenge over the removal of her British citizenship. She travelled from East London to Syria nine years ago, aged 15, to join Islamic State. Her lawyers say they'll keep fighting, though. Legal expert Alex Dos Santos says they could yet appeal. There is a possibility, if they can persuade the Court of Appeal to certify grounds of being of public importance, um, to have another attempt to get the Supreme Court to adjudicate on matters. Now, that would be a, a different appeal to the previous matter the Supreme Court looked at. Child serial killer Lucy Letby will have her bid to challenge her convictions heard by the Court of Appeal in April. She was sentenced to 14 whole life orders after being found guilty of the murders of seven babies and the attempted murder of six others. 
Experts will attempt to move and dispose of an ex- unexploded World War II uncovered in World War II bomb uncovered in a garden in Plymouth. Plymouth Council have told all residents who live within 300 metres of the route to leave their homes in the next hour. Superintendent Phil Williams from Devon and Cornwall Police explains how the operation will be carried out. The bomb is going to be taken from the address down to a slipway near the Tor Point Ferry where it will be taken out to sea and then safely disposed of. There's obviously an element of risk. It's been assessed by, um, by the Army who have deemed this is the uh, lowest risk. And Joe Root's unbeaten century has put England's cricketers in a decent position at the end of the first day on the fourth test against India. The tourists recovered from 112 for five at lunch to close on 302 for seven. And a quick look at the weather on the island. Mostly dry and bright today with sunny intervals and only isolated showers. Maximum temperature of seven degrees Celsius. Manx Radio News at five minutes past one, the next at two o'clock. In the meantime, keep up to date by following Manx Radio on social media or begin to manxradio.com. Got a guilty eating pleasure? Food that's not good for you but tastes great? Try ShopRite's range of healthier alternatives. Better for you doesn't have to mean boring. Available now at ShopRite. Do you want to love Mondays? Are you looking for a change or wanting to take the next step in your career? Contact the recruitment experts at Itchy Feet Recruitment, who have the best connections and hundreds of live job vacancies with leading employers. Sign up online and receive the latest jobs via email or SMS. You can also submit your CV or book an appointment at a time and location that suits you. Visit itchyfeet.im. Love Mondays again with Itchy Feet Recruitment. Cannell's Agricultural Supplies have been serving the good folk of the north for over 30 years. Supplying homegrown wheats, whole and rolled oats, working clothing, fencing, animal feeds, parts, tools and emergency supplies. Call Julia on 880206 or find Cannell's on Facebook. One architectural design company has particular expertise in achieving planning approval for a wide variety of projects, from landmark buildings to spectacular homes. Talk to the experts at Ellis Brown and get your project off the ground. For excellence in design, search Ellis Brown. Firestone Rubber Roof Shop for one-piece flat roofing systems. No joints, no leaks. We also line commercial box gutters in one piece up to 60 meters with a 20-year written warranty against leakage. Call Rubber Roof Shop on 49667. Patricia Wild Opticians is celebrating over 30 years of friendly, caring service in Farm Hill and Ramsey. Visit us for professional eye care with stress-free parking. Phone Patricia Wild Opticians on 813 977. Manx Radio. Manx Radio's budget coverage. Brought to you by Crow Isle of Man. Welcome back. We are live from the Barrel Suite in the Legislative Buildings this afternoon. Another hour of budget analysis to go. Uh, Phil, we've got some questions from the audience. Yes, loads of questions. And uh, first up. Hi. So uh, I do want to actually start off on a fairly positive note. I, I do think that more support for people uh, who have families is fantastic. More support for pensioners is fantastic. More support for childcare is really, really great. But I think the core frustration that a lot of people have is that the burden and the cost of providing that support overwhelmingly falls on middle earners. And I know to some extent that that was touched on. But when you take a look at the tax strategy, the tax strategy specifically works and the the outlines in that policy specifically work toward making sure the people who earn the most aren't people who earn their income through wage labor, the people who earn their income through capital gains, earn their income through dividends, earn their money through corporate tax, and they themselves aren't going to be shouldering the burdens of providing this additional support. And I think the vast majority of people are happy to pay additional resources to support our NHS and support people who need help. But I think that there's a question of fairness and whether the island's priorities and budget should fo- solely be focused on attracting wealthy at the expense of people who actually live and drive the economy. And the second question I have, and this is something we are talking about for a few years, is that with regards to housing, uh, the Chief Minister has spoken about Housing Association, and he has spoken about the Housing Communities Board, but in this budget there is nothing tangible to deal with the housing crisis, and we are. this is a third budget produced by this administration, and there's nothing to sort of see that is anything going to change. If, if, if you don't want me I'll just say that, that was uh, Devon Watson there from uh, Douglas Council. Yeah, th- thanks very much for your question. I think you're, you're quite right. One of the issues 
I have as Treasury Minister is when you look at the income demographics of the Isle of Man, it's heavily skewed towards lower middle income earners. So any sort of taxation you have in terms of personal tax hits those people, which is why we need to increase lower incomes and average earnings, particularly looking at the living wage, which went on, it would be one of the commitments here um, in this administration. When you're talking about broadening out the tax burden, i.e. the income that comes into government that can then be spent on key services, again, the taxation strategy looks at how we can do that by keeping our international competitiveness going, keeping the 010, but looking at some of the big corporations that will be included in the OECD Pillar 2 um, solution, looking at how we can um, allow them to pay corporation tax on our island for activities that happen here because they're going to be taxed anywhere else. And it was really interesting after my budget speech the following day in South Africa they announced that they were going to sign up for that as well. So it is going to be global tax rules that we can make the best of in terms of making sure that we have that money coming into the Isle of Man government. And in terms of housing, I agree with you that, that what, we've, what we've been doing has taken time. There is more money into the Housing Communities Board in this budget, and they are actually really accelerating some of the changes that they're bringing forward to actually support people. But also, from a Treasury perspective, we're bringing forward through working with local authorities, particularly um, some of the initiatives that Douglas has had in terms of bringing in empty and derelict properties back into use by looking at the rates that are charged on them. I just want to ask you a question. We keep hearing this term, squeezed middle. Who is the squeezed middle, in your opinion? Have you done some modelling about that? Yeah, I mean, for, for my, from my perspective, the squeezed middle are people on medium income who are earning enough not to have to claim some of the benefits that are provided, such as um, EPA. They may still be getting things like child benefit. That, that's fine. Have you got um, a figure, though? Do you know what that person's earning? It, in terms of median earnings, they're around about £35,000. It's those people who are earning enough not to qualify for, for benefits, but actually are still um, paying for an awful lot of things in terms of, um, you know, in terms of housing, in terms of some of the increased costs we've seen across um, you know, the, the general, general um, in, um, expenditure, but particularly energy costs, which is why this administration brought the electricity freeze in faster than any other jurisdiction in the Isle of Man, why we work, we've been working with banks utilities not only to allow prices to start coming down, but also investing in a greener economy in the future to provo provide on-island energy through sustainables that will also guarantee some of our energy security. Phil. Alex Cowley from the Isle of Man Youth, uh, Youth Select Committee yeah. uh, wants to ask a question. As chair of the Youth Select Committee, my main concern and our objective is to create and bring more affordable housing as well as support first-time buyers, renters and people even care. I ask if any of this is taken into consideration in the budget and if so, what plans are made? You claim the budget is for the island's future, but the youth are the future and I can't see myself buying a house anytime soon. I mean, if you don't mind, first of all, thank you very much for coming on today and thank you for your committee because, again, we've, we've heard a lot earlier on in the, in the programme about voices being heard and I think the voices of younger people are often completely overlooked by traditional politics. So thank you for that. In terms of housing, I think you're absolutely right to talk about different needs. So some people need rental housing. They may be, oh, again, the squeeze, squeeze middle may not be eligible for all social housing. They'll be, they'll be in the private rental sector. And how we make sure that they're getting access to good quality, affordable and accessible rental, rental accommodation. But at the same time, how they can then, if they want to buy, save for a deposit and get a mortgage that, that will then allow, allow them to buy a house. I think as in, in the adjacent aisle, we do have a mismatch here between um, actually the supply and demand of housing, of whatever, whatever tenure, um, what, this what this government have been trying to do is look at the blockers for housing development, which lie within planning, work with some of the larger developers to unlock some of the larger, some of the larger um, pl planning developments that are coming forward with hundreds of houses right the way across the island, but also looking at how these can be brought online and on stream fairly quickly. But also, more importantly, look at a range of options in terms of renting, whether it's through uh, a, housing, ha uh, a housing association, and working with some of the banks here in terms of the availability of mortgages for people of all incomes. It's interesting, Dr. Anson, when you talk about working with developers, and very often we'll hear about plans with so many properties earmarked as affordable. Who defines 
what affordable actually is? Um, there are various ways of, of looking at affordability. A lot of it is based on average earnings. So it's a multiplier of average earnings in the same way as people calculate mortgages. And there are different ways you can look at that. What we have through the first time buyer scheme is a way that people can afford houses actually cheaper than with the market um, cost of those, but will buy into those with the um, absolute guarantee those are then not sold off for, as a profit, that people buy a house as a home, not as an investment. But that is, that is made available to them as well through, through those schemes, which are supported by the Department for Infrastructure. And you're happy that those discussions that you have with developers are actually meaningful? Like, are, are they actually hearing what you're saying? Because the, listening to somebody like Alex there, she's not even thinking that she's ever going to be able to afford a house at the moment. You, you will be. I think that that's 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 been an issue for many generations in terms of affordable housing, um, and what we've seen particularly over the last three years is a quite dramatic increase in the price of housing on the Isle of Man. Again, we can deal with that demand by looking at some of the strategic sites we go, we've got by looking at. Um, how we can free up the planning process to bring these forward far quicker, um, but also in the right way, because there is a, always a balance to be made in terms of providing extra housing, providing the infrastructure to support that housing, but also making sure that we don't just build on greenfield sites and ruin our countryside. Hello there, I'm Gary Pearce from Hopes and Dreams Childcare Group. Um, I'd like to congratulate the Treasury Minister on the announcement in the budget to fund the childcare strategy, I think, um, and give it a real chance of success. The, uh, the investment that you're making now is going to pay off uh, handsomely, and the uh, importance for the childcare sector is that we are having that dialogue with government, and that um, contrary to the headline-grabbing antics of uh, the UK government, our government has been exceptionally reserved in how it has actually supported parents and children um, for success and in collaboration with the childcare sector to deliver actual meaningful gains for the island. So thank you very much indeed. Well, thank, thank you for your comments. And, and by, by the way, he, you, you, you inv you've invited people today that people aren't planted here by government. If we can just get that right. I mean, I, mean, I think, I think you're, you're quite right. In, in the United Kingdom, um, Jeremy Hunt announced in his autumn statement last year that they were going to expand childcare without talking to the sector themselves. And, and I, I think what we're trying to do with this budget and this administration is be honest with people. This is what we want to achieve, but we've got to take people on a road to get there. And particularly in terms of childcare, in terms of access, and affordability and provision, especially for those children with special educational needs, um, we need to do that with the sector. We need to make sure the resources are there, but also the understanding is there, and that two-way understanding. And I think by working together, we can achieve an awful lot for this island in an honest way to, that actually makes sure that when we announce something, we can deliver on it. And I think the Chief Minister would absolutely agree that this, this government is about delivering for the people of the Isle of Man. And I think, sorry, but just quick, I mean, you know, if we're going to address some of our longer-term challenges, including demographics, including getting people to stay on the island, uh, Gary, you know, we, we have to invest in our children and we have to give parents confidence that they have a government who is going to help support them, particularly in those very delicate and challenging early years that we all know um, exist. And that's why, you know, when you scrape away all the, the Facebook headlines and get to the actual detail here, the initiative in the child care strategy, the child benefit increase, will help our families, particularly those in that, those squeezed middle brackets, have confidence that they are getting the support necessary. It solves all their problems, but it will give them confidence that we are going to be here to support them. And by the way, the knock-on impact it, for that, it means that people are freer, more available for businesses, able to get out, get out to work and generally have a positive impact, both on society, but also on, a, on the economy. Another question? Yes, uh, David Gorn, um, who do you represent on this occasion? Well, that's a good question, Phil. Um, I think I'm talking on behalf of the Food Bank at the moment, actually. Um, but I would congratulate the Treasury Minister and acknowledge that he has given a considerable uplift in the benefit system, which will help a lot of people. Uh, my concern is when we talk about the squeeze middle, 
Um, uh, how do we define the squeeze middle? Well, from a food bank perspective and, and from some of the other charities, it's people who are in work but are not earning enough to meet their requirements to fund their families for the cost of daily living. Um, in December, we gave out 500 food parcels. Now, that's higher than we were giving out at the maximum time of COVID. That situation is continuing in January. We haven't got the final figures yet, but we know it's going to be in excess of 500. So that, that is not falling off. Uh, we also know that the Salvation Army Debt Counselling Service is snowed under. And these are people with genuine needs. Uh, housing matters are snowed under. Um, so these are issues we need to address. Some years ago, we did have a joint committee, which was called Cold, Hungry and Homeless, dreadful name. Uh, what I would ask is that we reconvene that meeting so that the third sector can actually make its views known and be part of that dialogue and represent the people who are the squeeze middle. And, and, and that's what I would like to see coming out of, uh, of the budget. Does this represent, perhaps, Chief Minister and Treasury Minister, people are going under the radar and, and government may have one idea of how things are going, but actually the reality on the ground is quite different. I, I, th I think pe people are, are sometimes under the radar for their own reasons or specific reasons. And again, the Food Bank do a, a fantastic job dealing with people sometimes with temporary problems, sometimes with long -ter longer, longer term problems, particularly in terms of addictions and things like that. I think in terms of low pay, that's why having a, you know, a decent rise in the minimum wage this year is so important, why twinning that to merging with the living wage is so important, why the investment not just in the benefit system but in access to the benefit system through the computerisation of that is so important, that people who are, who are claiming benefits get those benefits a lot quicker because certainly talking to the food bank, sometimes it's people who are in, you know, going in between um, employment, unemployment or going through perhaps breakdowns in terms of their family life or domestic abuse or things like that suddenly find themselves in a situation they've never been in before and don't know the way out of that but what, what the food bank have been very good at is signposting people for further help from social security and as mr gordon it's part of getting people to recognize the situation but just very quickly picking up on something else that was said there there are an awful lot of people falling beneath the radar because they are coming directly to the third sector and that's not getting recorded in government statistics as mr gordon asked there would you be happy to reconvene that group that he was talking about? Yeah, I mean, that, that, that group was set up at a particular time, I, as I understand, through the Cabinet Office, to look at getting that real-time feedback from the third sector at a time when we were going through massive changes in terms of inflation and electricity prices. So it's certainly something we, we can look forward to. What we also are really keen is working with the third sector, because a lot of people on the panel have already talked about the data and, and actually um, sense-checking what's happening outside of, of Douglas, sometimes outside, certainly, of Timwald. And, and working with the third sector is certainly one way we can do that. All right, uh, Mick Hewitt, I'm the full-time officer for Prospect Trade Union. I've got a couple of questions. One in relation to the uh, increased, or alleged increase in funding for Manx Care. Uh, and you'll correct me if I'm wrong, which is why I'm asking. How much percentage-wise of that money is actually to bring health services up to a, a, a restorative level in terms of under funds in previous years and how much of it is actual real new money to improve services and not just maintain where we're at at the moment. If, if I can answer that one, so what we've tried to do with Manx Care is look at their current operating budget, what they need, what they've needed in, over the last 12 months, bake that in rebase that budget and then increase it year on year and I think for the first time in this budget we've got a five-year funding plan for Manx Care which is based not just on inflationary increase their their efficiency savings but is also looking at the increased cost of providing health care which is always above and beyond the the baseline rate of, of domestic inflation so that has been built in there one to to make sure that they've got the money to operate now but also that they've got the ability to do some of the transformation change that we know and we need we know that needs to be brought through brought through in march um minister hooper will be bringing the new manx mandate which sets out the priorities for the coming year and as Theresa cope has talked about a lot of these are based on community services keeping people out of hospital dealing with people in their homes and communities to keep them well and not allow them to to become ill and then go in go 
into um, the hospital. And that's not just better for the patient, but obviously is far better for our community. So this is real money going in to make real improvements in the NHS. We're just going to hear briefly from Theresa Cope before we have a short break, and then Mr Hugh will come back for your other question after that break. Theresa Cope. So I absolutely acknowledge that Manx Care has been given a really good level of funding that enables us to, to really start to have impact on some of those areas. I, I think what it comes back to is expectation. So Sir Jonathan Michael's report did set a funding formula and we are not where that funding formula would say we would be. So, you know, we're still 40 million adrift of what Sir Jonathan Michaels said we would have had, but I also acknowledge we've had a substantial up uplift. Um, it also assumes that we will have made um, five million pounds worth of efficiency savings. So that 347 already assumes that five million pounds has been delivered in terms of efficiency savings, which is really, really important because it's important we demonstrate we are efficient and productive. Mm -hmm. Have you made those savings? Uh, we will have made, uh, well, that's going into ne next year. We have made £7.5 million of savings in this financial year. And since Manx Care started, over £20 million of savings has come out. So whilst that's lost in the overall to totality of an overspend position, Manx Care can demonstrate that year on year, it is delivering more with less. Um, and we are driving out the efficiency. You're listening to Manx Radio's budget programme. We'll be back after this. Tax and accounts feel like a grey cloud above your head. <sighs> Step into the sunshine with Crow Isle of Man. Our friendly team of chartered accountants take time to listen to your business needs and work with you to prepare for the future. From tax and accounts to audit and payroll, our track record of quality and client satisfaction speaks for itself. Visit crow.im or call 627335. Crow Isle of Man. Smart decisions. Lasting value. For over 100 years, Manx National Heritage has been collecting objects for the people of the Isle of Man. From art to archaeology, national history, motorcycles and more, our museums are home to the national treasures of the Isle of Man. Discover their story at the Manx Museum and House of Manannan. Open daily from half past nine until half past four. How do I get, get out? Oh, 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 oh no! Grandad, it's not real. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> the fun never stops with Shaw's Unlimited Fibre Broadband. From £39.95 a month, it's the cheapest on island. Landline not needed. Find out more at shaw.com or see us in store. Sarah always admired her father's strength. But as years went by, she noticed subtle changes. His once sharp memory began to fade. Dad, you forgot our Sunday lunch again. With Man Benham, Sarah found a way to ensure her father's assets and dignity remained protected. Now I know Dad's future's secure, no matter what. Protecting tomorrow's peace of mind today. Learn more at manbenham.com or call us on 639 350. Manx Radio's budget coverage. Brought to you by Crow Isle of Man. It's just gone one we We're going to come quickly to the Chief Minister who has to leave uh, in a moment, but you wanted to respond to some of Mr Hewer's comments. Well, I do, because I think, I think uh, uh, Mick Hewer raised a very valid question, a very important question, um, actually. And, I mean, I think this is not a health debate, of course, but, you know, one of the reasons why I didn't actually say stop investment, Beth, in health, but what I said, that there would be a lot of challenges if Max Care couldn't keep within their budget is this, you know, we have a funding formula. We understand, you know, that formula says theoretically we should have another 40 million, uh, as Theresa's just outlined, on top of the 40 million that we've already given. But of course, you know, where we go with a, with a, with a healthcare service that is expanding in need in, in many areas, we've seen a lot of post-COVID pressures, we've got the demographic pressures, obviously. Um, uh, and funding that appropriately is going to become an increasingly bigger question, particularly if we can't stay within budget. So the point I was making in the budget, Mick, was to say actually 
we've got to try it. You know, there's only a finite pot <laughs> without then drawing down even more money from, from you know, the, the, the public or, or delivering, cut, cutting other services and pushing it into, into health. So it's really important that we continue to stay on top of that. And, and really, I think, uh, you know, Theresa's very clear on this, I think, to the board. Uh, there's a lot of extra investment gone in. We're putting a lot of trust now in Manx Care to to effectively deliver in budget. And then we, that way we can have confidence, I think, in the future for our, for our future in investment program. If we can't stay within the current investment program, then I think there's a lot, lot of other bigger issues that, you know, as a nation, we, we need to discuss about what sort of healthcare service we want and, um, and what's being delivered and, and how that's paid for, Mick. We'll come to uh, Mick here again. You had another question? I did, uh, and this one's specifically about 2020 for in terms of pay uh, so you'll appreciate that our members are already on to us because we're in March next week about pay awards for next year uh, and they're telling us that they're going to be looking at uh, at least inflation and probably inflation plus otherwise they're going backwards uh, the two percent tax increase obviously they're on to us about about that because they see that as a as a loss in terms of what they gained in the past couple of years uh, during pay negotiations. So the question is, can you tell me what has been allocated in the budget specifically for pay awards for 2024 yeah. uh, and what's been passed on to departments? Because obviously we're going to be in pay negotiations now and probably over the next two or three months. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I mean, there's, there's two things. One, I think everyone, both from a government perspective and a worker's perspective, would like to start pay negotiations earlier so that they can be concluded. Also looking at perhaps multi-year deals so that people have got that certainty going forward. But in terms of inflation, we, it looks on a downward trajectory at the moment. It's 4.4% on, on the Isle of Man. It's 4% in the UK. The Bank of England forecasts are that it will probably hit 2 or 3%. We've tried to work with different um, departments to anticipate what their demands might be. One of the issues we do have, though, on the Isle of Man is that some of our key workers, whether they be teachers, whether they be doctors, nurses, whether they be police officers, some of their pay um, terms and conditions are very much dictated by what happens in the UK as well. And to retain and recruit people, we need to try to balance that. So there is no exact figure that's been given. Um, and what we, we need to do is sit around the table and see what, the, what the, the needs of your members are and see how they can fit within the departmental budgets. What we've been quite clear with departments is that whilst they're given a budget, they have to operate within that budget, as the Chief Minister has said. So if pay negotiations end up being more than they can afford, they need to rationalise and reprioritise the services they provide. Theresa Cope, obviously pay is one of the, the big things for Manx Care. You mentioned agency staff who I don't know, but it, it feels like sometimes maybe they could just name their price. So you want to get people on the payroll. There's also that perception about consultants dictating costs and things like that. Where, where is that situation up to? Yeah, so, I mean, that's all part of our programme, you know, our very um, focused cost improvement programme. And it's all about value for money. Yes, we want to um, recruit and retain senior staff, um, you know, doctors, nurses, um, allied health professionals. But yes, I mean, part of what they expect, and, and I have monthly meetings with all of staff side, um, and I lead the pay negotiations for, for Manx Care. So I understand the expectation. And just to put it into some context, you know, we have, we expect to spend eight million pounds in 24-25 on pay awards. Um, against that sort of 347, we will outturn at around 338. So actually, the pay award for staff potentially will take away all of that additional funding from our from our baseline. You know, it is in, 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 well, we need to make sure we have additional cost improvements, which is why we've been looking at cost improvement programmes circa £10 million, um, because we need that additional efficiency um, and funding to be able to continue the level of investment in all of the other services that are outlined in our mandate. But, it, you know, it is a very difficult position, and it, it is made worse when you are having to sort of do pay negotiations so so late in, in, in the year. Um, I hope we can all get to the point of settling on this year's pay deal 
um, in the next couple of weeks, but we very, very quickly need to get something on the table for 24, 25 to give that level of certainty and to start those negotiations. Very final comment from the Chief Minister. Yeah. Uh, and I apologise in advance because I, I have to go to a long-standing uh, appointment, Beth, so I apologise to your, to your listeners for my slightly early departure. But I, I would just like to leave um, you know, Mick and, and everybody else with, with a final thought from my perspective when it comes to pay. You know, Treasury Ministers had a hugely difficult job. Um, in fact, this administration has had a very hugely difficult job when you look at the post-COVID hangover, the amount of money that was uh, being spent, the amount of eaten into our reserves, the inflation, the wars, the inflation spikes, etc. He started off with a £150 million deficit, i.e. subsidised from reserves, £150 million. He's got it down to 125 despite everything that's happened this year. You know, next year, I think about £96 million or so forecast. But if we blow that back up, you know, the, 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 the need then for government to take even more radical action will we'll, we'll, we'll become an, a, 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 an overwhelming force, you know. We're setting out a plan where we're trying to bring this correction back in gradually, sensibly, investing in the right areas, growing that private sector contribution, you know, whilst at the same time investing in public services. But it is a delicate balance. We've got to deliver in budget. If those pay awards come in above that, then that department service level is going to have to be impacted because we've got to have, we've set out in our island plan, the latest iteration, you'll, you'll be able to read now and see in March when we'll debate it. But you know, you'll know, you notice that the council of ministers as a whole have said to the government, you know, financial discipline now is our number one priority. You know, we cannot come to the public with that level of overspend you know, we have to accept all the pressures that we've had, but we can't do it. And we just can't just get out, the, keep getting out the checkbook because the damage that we've got, you know, we've got to leave behind this administration has a responsibility to leave behind the safety nets and security for the next generations, you know, and the reserves for this island, you know, we should treasure and look after. And we've been through a huge, huge amount in terms of the challenges we've faced, COVID, post-COVID inflation wars. But there has to come a point where that discipline has to be absolutely rigorous. And, and, just, you know, and I think that responsibility must also go out to those in the other negotiating side as well from, from the other side. But and Chief Minister also, people want to see that discipline within government in terms of things like government headcount, which has grown despite uh, maybe promises earlier. And, and we go back to spending again and yeah, but making but sure... If you look at the headcount, and I mean, I think this is about data and statistics... You know, the but it's vast about perception as well, though, isn't I know it? it's perception, but the investment that has grown most fundamentally has been in health and social care, you know, and we've done that, you know, because of the pressures that have come on, the COVID, post-COVID pressures, demographic pressures, you know, but that's why I say, you know, discipline is, is vital, um, and, 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 and this is all about getting the balance absolutely right, because you know, there is a finite pot. We've got a responsibility yep. to the taxpayers. We've got a responsibility for service delivery. We've got a responsibility to our staff, you know. So just getting these, the, the, the balance right is, is, is critical because, and, you know, if we all recognize that and understand the details and the challenges that we are facing, then and, and we can reach conclusions that we understand what impacts they will have and are the benefit of the whole society. We will be in a, in a good place, Mick. And I, I want to say, despite the earlier, uh, you know, challenges, you know, our view and my view has always been that we get fair pay to the public sector, but we also recognise that, you know, where that stretches boundaries, then we have to find those efficiencies and we have to deliver, you know, those, 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 those cost savings um, to keep within... The, the public, uh, quite right, public demand that we manage our budgets. Chief know, Minister, thank you very much indeed. We'll have one quick question, then we'll take another short break, Phil. Okay. Claire Watterson from the Chamber of Commerce. Um, thank you, Treasury Minister. Um, you've mentioned, and obviously the Chief Minister has just um, said that it's his number one priority for the next year, is to make sure that departments, not just health, are going to be expected to operate within their budgets. Can you shed a bit more clarity around who is going to hold the departments accountable to this and what are the likely repercussions should they not stay within their budgets? Certainly. I, I, again, I think when you're doing a budget like this, 
the, the, the small print is how we're going to fit the budget, how we're going to give the taxpayer value for money with what we do. So one of the things we've been doing within um, the Treasury Department is look at how we can get, get that uh, uh, financial advice into those departments. Um, and we've got um, the financial advisory service with accountants, with people in, embedded in, in the, all the various departments. We bring them together to share best practice, but also make sure we have real-time data throughout the, the year in terms of any underspends, any overspends, any cost pressures, so we can nip them in the bud. It, we will be having to um, analyze far more than ever before, given the inflationary pressures, exactly where spending is going. And at an early stage, if it looks like various departments are going off course, then absolutely dealing with it there and making some of those difficult decisions that people have been asking for. We've made the difficult decision to put up taxation temporarily. We will continue, if necessary, to make those difficult decisions and try to commu communicate those in the right way to the public. And just very quickly, you say temporarily, so you're absolutely sure, are you, that those tax rates are going to come down again? The idea, again, through the tax strategy, which is going to be debated by Tim Mulder, is to create a healthcare levy to work out what that would look like so we can get sustained funding for the health service. But you are planning to bring the tax rates down again? That's, that's the idea, yeah, absolutely. You're listening to Max Radio's special budget programme. We'll be back in just a moment. Tax and accounts feel like a grey cloud above your head. <sighs> Step into the sunshine with Crow Isle of Man. Our friendly team of chartered accountants take time to listen to your business needs and work with you to prepare for the future. From tax and accounts to audit and payroll, our track record of quality and client satisfaction speaks for itself. Visit crow.im or call 627 335. Crow Isle of Man. Smart decisions. Lasting value. Have you been invited to take part in the Household Income and Expenditure Survey? It's one of the most important surveys for our island because the information you provide is vital data for our island's financial planning. It helps us calculate our VAT revenue from the UK. Plus, it gives us a better understanding of the financial strains on residents so we can support those who are struggling. March is the last month you can take part. So visit gov.im forward slash H-I-E-S now. Everyone's more conscious of energy usage nowadays. So Manx Utilities has begun installing smart meters for standard domestic customers island-wide. With our Smart Living app available too, you'll be in control of tracking and managing your energy. No need to contact us. We'll be in touch when we're ready to fit your smart meter. Visit the Smarter Living page at manxutilities.im. Manx Utilities, delivering a smarter future. It's good to talk. It's how we get things done. So when you apply for a personal loan from Black Horse, you'll get support from one of our relationship managers who's there to talk you through your application. You could borrow up to £50,000 with up to seven years to pay it back and you could receive your money within 24 hours of approval. Ready to talk? Go to blackhorseoffshore.co.uk to request a call back today. Finance subject to status. Applicants must be 18 or over. Manx Radio's budget coverage, brought to you by Crow Isle of Man. Welcome back uh, into the final part of the programme. It's going really quickly here this afternoon, just after 20 to 2. I just wanted to come very quickly to John Webster, because I was interested in something you said earlier, that you would have had uh, different thoughts on how you would have approached this budget. Could you give us a 30-second rundown of those? Right. Um, OK. The, the, the type of um, taxes I would have introduced would have been, number one, something to um, release some of the accommodation which is being used by people for accommodation addresses and for investment purposes. Um, I'd have put land speculation tax on to encourage quick development of, of land. Um, I, I've got a list of 10 uh, different taxes I'd, I'd introduce. I know you haven't got time for me to do that, but the, the big issue I see is what is going to be the next generator of income for the Isle of Man and one of the notable absences in this budget uh, I hope you don't mind me saying this Treasury Minister is the absence of any comment of the business environment and how we are going to grow the business which is going to produce the 
good jobs and the taxation which we need to fund our health and other services. That's the starting point, really. And we've got so many impediments to business now, not the least of which is access to the island. Um, I regularly hear of people who say, I'm not going to the Isle of Man, or we can't have meetings on the Isle of Man, or I can't get to meetings in the UK because the services are so unreliable. Uh, it's not just the air services, it's the boat services now as well. So that needs to be tackled, and I think I'd have put some money in the budget, uh, this is the spending side, um, to ensure that um, we've got more reliable services than we've got at the moment. Let's go to some more questions from the floor now. Uh, Phil. Hi, Paul Weatherall, Chair of Liberal Vannin. Um, we're an invited audience uh, by Manx Radio today. Uh, on Monday evening um, next week, uh, the Treasury Minister has kindly agreed to come along to a Liberal Vannin meeting, but it's for all members of the public uh, to put their own views, ask questions about the budget at the Manx Legion Club, 7.30 p.m., Monday the 26th. Um, having given that plug, um, I think the, the budget that's been announced uh, earlier this week has led to a debate which will continue for at least the year to come on the value of public services and how we pay for them. And I think that's to be welcomed because for too long we've not really had um, openness and transparency about the budget process and about what's really involved in providing the services that people on the island expect and are, are wanting. The Chamber of Commerce has uh, said that this is a divisive budget uh, and that it's affected badly um, people on low pay and people running small businesses. Uh, I suspect that some of their comments are related to the upcoming debate about what the level of the legal minimum wage will be this year. Um, the government has committed to bring that into line with the Manx living wage um, within the lifetime of this administration, and I hope that they continue to take steps to do that this financial year. Um, the current legal minimum wage is, I think, 10.95 at the moment for adults. Uh, the Manx living wage is currently just over 12 pounds, so I would hope that somewhere around about 11 pound 50 per hour is going to be thought of for the minimum wage this coming year. Um, thank you very much. The only other thing I'd like to say is that, um, or ask perhaps the Treasury Minister to comment on, is how much in the budget is really geared towards um, encouraging investment in the economy of the island, and in particular um, things like training and apprenticeships, um, which is in dire need uh, and improving the productivity on the island. I think improving productivity of people already on the island is probably more important than growing the population. Treasury Minister? Yeah, and then Kirk, that tallies into one of Mr Webster's comments um, in terms of where, where in the budget is, is investing in the economy. Again, the, the, this, this is a budget to fund a government programme, the Ireland Plan, which has got the economic strategy within it, and that clearly defines what we're going, going to do going, moving forward. In terms of uh, Mr Weatherall's comments about skills, I think he's absolutely right. Um, efficiency and productivity can be devised really for, for by two ways. One is investing in people in terms of skills and resources. We've now got a skills board set up which links Department for Enterprise, which links Department for Education, Sport and Culture and the private sector and hopefully the third sector as well to work together to make sure we have the skills available on the skills training available on the island for people of all ages, whether it's at school or career breaks or going forward. In terms of um, some of the other comments about investment in the economy, we've got an economic strategy board, an economic strategy fund, which still in, in the budget we've got over £50 million that's unallocated there. Some of that is going absolutely into those key areas such as connectivity in terms of working with airlines to make sure that we not only have the right routes available but we have reliability in terms of those routes and they're at the right time both for business but also for um, uh, people travelling just for leisure as well. Do you think maybe people think there are a lot of strategies and reports and boards talking about things but not actually much action? That's what people think. 
and, and I think sometimes government can get weighed down by tr constantly analysing and justifying what it does. I think we have shown that we will act when we need to. We did that during COVID. We did that when the war in Ukraine showed massive hikes in energy prices and inflation in general. We will continue to do that. But what the budget is about is getting that long-term planning rather than trying to constantly react to a perma crisis is actually have that long-term planning and stability so that we can get the right environment for people to invest in the island, develop their businesses and expand. Another question, Phil? Yes, Keith, uh, Keith Dalrymple from the Northern uh, Chamber of Commerce. Thank you, Phil. Thank you. Northern Chamber of Commerce, our members are primarily representative of the squeezed middle. Fortunately, my middle isn't quite as squeezed today. The squeezed middle are predominantly those people who are managing their finances, working within their personal budget. They're also people who are being obliged to dip into savings to pay for private health care, medical care of various kinds. And the conversations that I've had with members this week go along the lines well, I'll just spend what I have in savings, probably sell the house and throw myself upon the state. Just become a burden to the state. Now, there are people who have contributed, want to continue to contribute, and want you, Minister, and your colleagues to do what you're elected for, to set the conditions, to be facilitators and enablers for those people to continue to make their contribution to the economy of the Isle of Man. I'm sorry that the Chief Minister has left because he would have heard me say I have great sympathy for him. Having read in depth the island plan, the economic strategy, there are so many laudable aspirations, so much that would be good for the island. But sadly, I believe they're undeliverable under present circumstances and present conditions. So, in his absence, I make two comments and ask a question to you first, Dr. Allenson, and then to the whole panel. John Webster has made a comment about public-private sector there is no indication of public-private sector partnering on the Isle of Man as a genuine methodology for delivery of anything. The terms of the present budget proposals are divisive and are exacerbating an already polarised society, something which I see as relatively new in my life on the Isle of Man. We didn't have this polarisation. Mr. Darrow, Mr. But could we just get to the question? I apologise, we are just uh, running short of time. The, quest the, the question is, two questions. First one, would the Treasury Minister and his colleagues please stop talking about looking for efficiencies in the delivery of the various government departments? You know, in manufacturing industry, you can be de delivering widgets, millions of them, very, very efficiently. But if they're flawed widgets, you're not achieving the objective. I would think what we hope for within our government departments is effective delivery. There's another more archaic word, efficacious. My other question, final question, um, for the panel. Chief Minister has said that unless, and particularly Manx Carr, do not deliver within the new enhanced budget, well, well what? Well what? What next if they don't? Thank you very much. Treasury well, Minister, um, very briefly. Very, very briefly, so I disagree with you. 
Um, but I would do, obviously, with, with some of the sweeping statements you made. In terms of delivery, in terms of the evidence, if you look at the economic strategy update that was presented to Tim Wald in, Janu in January, if you look at the island plan updates that will be presented to Tim Wald in March, you will see the progress we've made. These are deliverable. We will succeed in doing those. You also talk about no liaison between government and, private and the private sector. You're wrong on that as well. And you know from the Chamber of Commerce the arrangements that you have with meeting with the Department for, for Enterprise already and the significant money, particularly that's been put into Ramsey by previous administrations and this administration in terms of um, helping the high street develop. In terms of asking me to stop talking about delivering efficiencies, no. I will constantly talk about delivering efficiencies for the Isle of Man in terms of government services, but you are right that these have to be quality and effective. And so uh, Theresa Cope from a Manx Care perspective has talked about CQC involvement for the first time in the history of our NHS. We are looking at patient safety and quality of service and putting that, that at the forefront of delivery of those services. That takes time, that takes effort of the staff, that takes money, but is absolutely integral that if people walk into a healthcare environment, they feel safe and get the best care available. Theresa Cope, very quickly. Yeah, and that's why we publish the CQC reports. That's that transparency mm. with the public about saying, these are the services available on the island, this is the standard they've reached, these are the action plans and the investment that's needed needed to get them to the required level. I, I also agree, you know, a lot of the efficiency savings we're driving also produce a quality impact. And as a board, we've been really, really clear to, to, to do that. In terms of the so what, well, you know, that's, that's the big question, isn't it? You know, I'm a health and care professional. I'm a clinician by background. I preside over an organisation which will always try and put safety and compliance first. Um, I will set a balanced budget. I take my financial responsibilities really, really seriously. But um, I won't preside over unsafe health and care services either. So, and neither will my board. Um, so we'll keep coming back to those discussions. But it is about the transparency. I think fundamentally there's a big question um, for the island, a big conversation to be had about eligibility. Because um, actually what does this amount of money buy, and it probably doesn't buy a comprehensive public sector health and care system. We're going to have to look at different methods. Okay, Theresa, to I'm just going to leave it there. So we've just got a couple of minutes. I'd like to get a couple of questions in, Phil. Yeah, um, this gentleman. Yeah, it's Adam Klukas, um, Senior Tax Manager at Crow. Um, I'm definitely part of the squeeze middle. Um, my dream for the island, I'd love to see a small, uh, in more efficient government um, that's just more accountable to the taxpayer. Um, in terms of specific question I'd love to see is, um, you know, we're expecting, a, the polls are indicating a Labour government's going to come in. Um, now, West Streeting is talking about potentially modernising the NHS. This might involve increasing private sector imp input into the health service. Is now the right time to start looking at these options and maybe social, insur uh, social insurance models that many European countries use? Theresa Cope. I think it probably is. Now, you know, I've always worked in the NHS. I'm NHS through and through. Um, but I do think we have to make... You can never, ever stop spending on health and care. Demand will always outstrip supply. Um, and so bringing in those different hybrid models might have to be where we can go in order to um, make sure we've got the highest quality of care for the island. If Very I, sorry, if I could just say, um, no. So I am committed to the NHS. I'm committed to the model of the NHS. It needs adequate funding so it can provide. I think there are things to do with eligibility, but this, the problems we are having in the healthcare system is because we need to invest in the people who run that service, not suddenly change towards a neocon model. Unbelievably, that brings us to the end of this programme. Uh, clearly, though, the discussions have only really just begun. So thank you so much to Crow Isle of Man for supporting this outside broadcast and the Timwald officers for allowing us to be here at the Barul Suite today. Thank you to our panel, Treasury Minister Dr Alex Allenson, Manx Care CEO Theresa Cope, Chair of the Manx Technology Group and former Economic Advisor Job Webster, uh, Director of Crow Isle of Man, Palm Harvey, and earlier the Chief Minister Alfred Cannon. Also to our invited audience, some of them will be doing some interviews views afterwards as well so we do want to hear what you have to say thank you to the whole max radio team as well who've helped put all of this together and if you've missed any part of the program you'll be able to find it on max radio's budget mini site and that's where you can find the budget broken down for you as well thank you for being with us today take care goodbye <laughs>
step into the sunshine with Crow Isle of Man. Our friendly team of chartered accountants take time to listen to your business needs and work with you to prepare for the future. From tax and accounts to audit and payroll, our track record of quality and client satisfaction speaks for itself. Visit crow.im or call 627335. Crow Isle of Man. Smart decisions. Lasting value. For over 100 years, Manx National Heritage has been collecting objects for the people of the Isle of Man. From art to archaeology, national history, motorcycles and more, our museums are home to the national treasures of the Isle of Man. Discover their story at the Manx Museum and House of Mananan. Open daily from half past nine until half past four. Oh! How do I get out? Oh, 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 oh no! Grandad, it's not real. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> the fun never stops with Shaw's Unlimited Fibre Broadband. From £39.95 a month, it's the cheapest on island. Landline not needed. Find out more at shaw.com or see us in store. Washing machine broken? Car had a prank? Unexpected bills arrived on your doorstep. Members of Manx Credit Union have applied for loans for all these reasons and more. Manx Credit Union provides savings and small loans for people living on the Isle of Man. Find out what we can do for you. Come and see our friendly team at Ragnall House on Peel Road in Douglas or visit mcu.im. Manx Credit Union. We're not just for you, we're with you. Terms and conditions apply. Manx Radio's budget coverage. Brought to you by Crow Isle of Man. Soft drink savers at ShopRite. Schweppes Lemonade 2 litre or Pepsi Max and Coke Zero 1.25 litres. Any three for £3. Pounds, with even more in store. ShopRite savers available now. 